next on Unsolved Mysteries. A forest ranger's quiet life is thrown into chaos when his family is attacked. 25-year-old Michael Rosenblum vanishes on the side of a Pennsylvania highway. His family suspects a police cover-up. When a police officer is gunned down in his own kitchen, his partner vows to find the killer. Also, a deathbed miracle and a spontaneous recovery. Were these people saved by the power of prayer? These are stories that are guaranteed to surprise you. I'm Dennis Farina, and for the next hour, it's Unsolved Mysteries. Just south of Pittsburgh in Baldwin Borough, Pennsylvania. 30 volunteer firemen gather on a steep bluff overlooking the Monongahela River. For anything that you find out of the ordinary. At the suggestion of a psychic, they are here to search for the remains of Michael Rosenblum, a young Pittsburgh man who has been missing for more than eight years. For Michael's father, Maurice, the search is one more desperate attempt to find out what happened to his son, who disappeared from a road that runs along the foot of the cliff. There is not the slightest possibility in my mind that he could be out there alive. I pray that that one in 10 million chance would happen. I guess you always have some hope. As long as I don't have a body, there's always hope. Maurice Rosenblum's search has triggered mysterious phone calls, the discovery of forged documents, and revelations of official cover-ups. It has even led to the firing of a police chief. What really did happen to Michael Rosenblum? During high school, Michael began experimenting with drugs and soon became a heavy user of prescription painkillers. His life spun wildly out of control, and his family struggled to help him get back on track. They insisted that he go to drug rehab. Let's get out of here. Don't worry about A month after Michael was released from drug rehab, he began behaving oddly. His mother found a bottle of painkillers in his bedroom, and that was it. She kicked him out. Michael left with his girlfriend, Lisa, in her car. I said to Michael, don't come back until you're completely off drugs, until you want to live your life the way you should. And that's, that's the way it is. I've always faulted myself for that, and I probably will till I die, that I didn't say, OK, we'll, we'll try again. Maybe tomorrow will be different. But the next day wasn't different. After a night of partying, Michael became extremely agitated. He insisted on driving Lisa's car, and then he left her stranded at a local gas station. Michael's last words were, go to my parents' house. I'll see you there in two hours. I figured, well, he took her car, and he took off for a day or two, and he'll be back or he'll call. We waited that night. There were no calls. I became seriously worried. My wife felt immediately that it was a terminal situation, that he was dead. I didn't. He would never have just left. When he left, there was money in his bank account. There was clothes were in his closet. And if he were going to have gone anywhere, he would have said to us, I plan to do such and such, and I'm going to take my money and go. But. It, all of that, his money is still in his bank account. The following day, the Rosenblums filed a missing persons report with the Pittsburgh Police Department. 
you need a starting point. Any homicide case, your dead body is your starting point. In this case, the car would have been the starting point. So it's important that we find the car as quickly as possible and then take the steps of notifying the media for their help and asking the general public if anybody saw the boy who was in the car, they know what happened to him. But after two weeks, they had found nothing. So Michael's father began his own search. He offered a reward for information, posted flyers, and traveled as far as California to find friends Michael might have contacted. I launched the investigation myself because I was concerned about finding him and seeing if I couldn't put him back on the right track again. Three months later, Police in a Pittsburgh suburb notified Lisa that her car had been found. Official records show that the car had been impounded on the very day that Michael vanished. We couldn't believe that they had that car for 91 days. Absolutely couldn't believe it. The Pittsburgh police had contacted every police department in this area looking for that specific car. And here that car was discovered in the police bonded tow yard less than three miles from where we're sitting right now. What happened the day Michael disappeared? The more his father learned, the less he felt he knew. According to police reports, just two hours after Michael left Lisa, a Baldwin police unit found the car on River Road. Two of the tires were flat, the keys were gone, and the engine was cool. The car had been towed to the Baldwin Borough car impound, where it remained resting on its bent tire rims for the next three months. One of the questions throws your whole investigation off. If we start in the beginning, we knew that car was on River Road. The whole picture would have changed drastically. If we had known that, that car was found in Baldwin that morning within hours, I strongly believe we would have known by now what had happened to Michael. When they found the car, after 91 days, my immediate reaction was that he was gone, dead. Maurice demanded an explanation. The Baldwin police claimed that they'd mailed Lisa a letter the day after the car was found, saying they had impounded it. Lisa says that she never received it. They eventually produced a copy of the letter dated the day after Michael disappeared, but Lisa still insisted she never received the letter from the Baldwin police. In my opinion, they deliberately misled the Pittsburgh police in the search, assuming that my son was never even involved. Why didn't they search for the young lady that owned the car? Around that same time, Maurice claims that he received two anonymous phone calls. The first one came in during the time that the car was gone. Hello. You know, they said that he was arrested. And I wrote it off as a crackpot. Hello. Hello. After the car was found, I received a second telephone call, just simply said that your son was arrested by the Baldwin police. Click, they were gone. This was just the first of many bizarre twists in Maurice's agonizing search for his son. Up next, a forged document points to a mysterious police cover-up in the death of Michael Rosenblum. Maurice Rosenblum offered a reward for information about his missing son, Michael. But after five months, the only concrete clues were the discovery of the car that Michael had been driving and two anonymous phone calls saying that Michael had been arrested. And then, in a shocking turn of events, the Baldwin police issued a warrant for Michael's arrest. They claimed that he was wanted in connection with a robbery that had taken place two and a half months after he had vanished. Now, the big twist in this whole thing was that everybody that's talked to the people who were the victims of the robbery 
They both told everybody from day one that the person that came in there was a white man, and he had aviator mirrored sunglasses on that covered high above his eyebrows and down almost to the bridge of his nose. So the only part they actually could see would be the forehead and the chin line. But yet the composite was made without sunglasses. There's no doubt in my mind that this composite was made from that first flyer put out on Michael Rosenblum back in February. It's just too perfect. One week after it was issued, the warrant was suddenly dismissed. Something very strange was going on in the borough of Baldwin. Were the Baldwin police working to solve this missing person's case, or were they trying to hide the truth? A full inquiry into the case cleared the police department of any wrongdoing. But years later, new evidence emerged. Six and a half years after his son disappeared, Maurice received an unsigned letter. It urged him to talk to a former Baldwin police dispatcher named Margaret Haslett. The tip would ultimately lead to accusations that the department, headed by police chief Aldo Gaburi, had mishandled Michael's case. Mr. Rosenblum showed me an anonymous letter that he had received indicating that if he contacted me, I had information regarding the uh, vehicle that the Baldwin police towed. Uh, I then told him that um, approximately two or three months after the vehicle had been towed, uh, the chief of police ordered his clerk, Fred Capelli, to type a letter uh, notifying the owner of the vehicle that it had been towed. Um, and the letter was backdated to uh, February 15th, the day after the vehicle was towed. The chief's former clerk confirmed Margaret's disturbing story. Approximately May 20th, the chief told me to type a letter in reference to the car that was towed from River Road. I never thought anything about it. I did what, it, what I was told to do. You know, he's my boss, so I did what he told me to do and I didn't uh, question it. Fred Capelli claims that after he typed the letter, the chief ordered him to sign the name of Chester Lombardi, the senior officer at the River Road scene that day. Lombardi is now deceased. He had asked Chester Lombardi to sign the letter, and Chester refused to sign it because it was backdated. So the chief told me to go ahead and sign Chester Lombardi's name to it, but don't mail it. He said, put it in a file. And that's what I did. Based on these new revelations, Maurice wrote an angry letter to the Baldwin Borough Council, demanding an investigation into what he thought was a cover-up. The council held a hearing on the matter and dismissed Chief Gaburi for interfering with the investigation into Michael's disappearance. When he was discharged, he appealed that to the Civil Service Commission. And their conclusion was uh, that the chief was not guilty. The Civil Service Commission voted to reinstate Gaburi as police chief, finding that there was no misconduct. They have never published the transcript of the hearings, but clearly, they did not believe Fred Capelli. Why they didn't believe me? Because he, the chief had friends on that civil service commission. And he wouldn't believe me no matter what I said. All I can say is this commission rendered his decision strictly on the evidence and the testimony that was presented at the hearing. The time that I'll let this go is when it ends. And it's not over yet. It's not over. We're getting close, but it's not over. Eight years after he disappeared, a bone fragment and some scraps of clothing were found near River Road. The bone could not be identified, but the pieces of clothing matched those Michael had been wearing. He just felt sick. I contended all along that something had happened to him, but the possibility that I might have proof in my pocket makes you kind of sick. 
That final proof was discovered four years later. A hiker in the River Road area found a piece of human skull and turned it into authorities. Tests confirmed that it belonged to Michael Rosenblum. After 12 years of searching and wondering, Michael's parents were finally able to bury their son. But for them, the agony isn't over. They still desperately want to know how and why Michael died. If you have any information about the death of Michael Rosenblum, please log on at unsolved.com. Next, decades after a police officer is murdered in his own kitchen, there are still no suspects, only questions. Cook County, Illinois. Outside the Academy Theater, the atmosphere is electric. It was the night of the Oscars, and like millions of Americans, Ralph Probst and his wife Marlene settled down in front of the television to watch the stars. Well, we were watching the Academy Awards on TV that night, and I must have dozed off. And the next thing I knew, there was this loud explosion that woke me up. I saw this cloud of smoke from behind the television set. When I went in the kitchen, Ralph was laying on the kitchen floor. Ralph had been shot once in the back of the head. By the time help arrived, he was dead. Ralph Prost was a 30-year-old Cook County, Illinois Sheriff's officer. Ralph left behind his wife, three small children, and a series of baffling questions that almost 50 years later remain unanswered. Four days after his murder, Ralph was laid to rest. On that afternoon, his partner, Bob Borowski, made a silent pledge. As I stood beside the casket and looked down at Ralph, I made a vow to him that I would find his killer and I would not rest until I get him. I figured it would be solved quickly, but it didn't turn out that way. Bob Borowski continued to search for his partner's killer. The crime scene evidence pointed to a carefully planned murder, but no suspect has ever been named. Perhaps you might have the missing clue to solve the murder of Ralph Probst. Bob and Ralph met for the first time shortly after Ralph graduated from the police academy. OK, gentlemen, let's shape up your inspection time. The two men were both assigned to the special elite tactical squad. Probst and Borowski, you've got Stickney Township tonight. We had a lot of problems out there last night. Everybody else in the department looked up at the TAC unit. We were a very elite unit. We were all spit and polish, and we were a very proud bunch. And Ralph was not only a partner, but he was also a friend, and it was that sort of relationship. You could depend on him, and he could depend on you. Driving again? Ralph played things strictly by the book and made some powerful enemies. A few months before his death, Ralph and Bob were assigned to guard a notorious mobster named Sam DiStefano. He had been transferred from the prison to a local hospital after complaining of stomach trouble. Here to guard you. You two lackeys are going to guard me. Sam, you can't have any visitors here. You folks are going to have to go. Come on. You're my doctor? Hang up. Call the doctor. Take this. Don't steal my apples, copper. Man, you're gonna have to go too. Get your hands off of her. Call my lawyer. You're what also you gonna have to eat the regular hospital food, just like everyone else in the hospital. Oh, I am. As a matter of fact, I do. That's why you're here. Now uh, lie down on the bed. Hey, you don't. Want when uh, Ralph handcuffed Di Stefano to the bed, he became very irate and threatened to kill him. Better grow eyes in the back of your head. If you need us, we'll be outside. Get out. Get out of here. We really didn't take it very serious. We felt that he was just a big bag of wind and just brushed it off. I don't think that it, the risk ever entered Ralph's mind. I really don't. I think it, to him it was a job. He enjoyed it. And I don't think he was ever afraid. I imagine in the back of anyone's mind something could happen. 
but I don't think he dwelled on it. On the night that Ralph was killed, police found a suspicious pattern of circumstantial evidence. It appeared that Ralph had been shot through the kitchen window. Okay, now secure the house. Make no sure one no in the neighborhood the saw the gunman, though a few people did hear a shot. A good, clear shot of this ricochet mark. The bullet that killed Ralph ricocheted off a kitchen cabinet and then fell onto the stove. It was fired from a rare 41 caliber Magnum handgun that had only recently been manufactured. Keep your eyes and ears working as what's going out on the street. See if there's any talk. Contact all your informants. Although there were only 2,000 of these guns in the United States, police were unable to locate the murder weapon. We don't have a motive on this one yet. It could be some nut who just doesn't like police officers. So when you're out there, be very careful. The only likely suspect, Sam DiStefano, was cleared. There were no other obvious suspects except one, Ralph's wife, Marlene. I know from the beginning of the investigation, I think what puzzled everybody is how I had seen smoke inside the house. But if the gunman had been outside, there wouldn't have been smoke inside. And yet when I woke up, that's the first thing I saw was this small cloud of smoke coming up from like in back of my television set. This puff of smoke led police to suspect that the shot had been fired from inside the house. Adding to their theory was the fact that the broken glass from the window was found in the yard, not on the kitchen floor. When you have a murder investigation, one of the first places you start with is with the family. Are you set inside? Yeah. The investigators conducted a test to see if Marlene was telling the truth. First, they fired from 15 feet away. There was no smoke and the glass fell inside. But then they fired from two inches away from the window. There was a puff of smoke inside the house. It was back all over me. I never seen anything like that. We found the glass came out back onto the shooter and fell to the ground and we had the puff of smoke inside the house. From that point on, we knew that Marlene was telling the truth. We determined that the shooter would have had to have been five foot 11 or taller in order for that uh, projectile to follow the path to where it struck Ralph. To strike the center of the back of the head where the entry point was took one terrific shot. My, my theory on Ralph's murder is that somebody knew Ralph was going to be in that position at that certain time. If anyone had been watching the house, they wouldn't have been able to know even what room we were sitting in unless they were standing by that kitchen window. Every other window was covered. There was too much light in the driveway, and that person did not stay there and wait for hours for Ralph to get in that certain position. Ralph was set up. I believe that possibly he was going to receive a phone call or he was going to make a phone call. Bob believes that Ralph may have been working on his own secretly in order to bring down a vice ring. In fact, several days before his death, he had been seen at the home of an ex-convict named Frank Calvise. He had spoken with Calvise's wife and then left. Come on in, I'll show you around. I think you'll like it. One week before the murder, a man resembling Calvise looked at a home for sale across the street from Ralph's home. As they toured the house, the visitor asked the owner a suspicious question. Was the floor plan similar to the one across the street? Most of the houses in this area were built about the same time, yeah. However, after identifying Calvise in a police lineup, the neighbor changed his story. Some are convinced that he feared retaliation. Frank Calvise died seven years later, and no charges were ever filed in connection with Ralph's death. Ralph had information on something, whether it be vice, pornography, fencing operation and whoever killed him knew that he was going to talk about it 
and they killed him before he could. At this time, I am unofficially still working on a case, and whoever did it, I've been making him awful nervous because he knows that I'm not giving up, that somehow, some way, somebody's going to say something and he's going to get caught. So somewhere, somebody's awful nervous, and I'm going to keep him that way. If you have any information about the murder of Ralph Probst, please log on to unsolved.com. Next, a kidnapped baby is returned to his parents. And later, a forest ranger wants to know who blew up his home. Baltimore, Maryland. In a previous episode, we profiled the frightening case of a baby boy who was abducted from the hospital just two days after he was born. A woman disguised as a nurse entered the room of Linda Norris. She instructed Linda to hand over her two-day-old son, Avery James, and return to her bed for a physical examination. The woman pulled the privacy curtain closed and then disappeared with Avery. This has really been, um, I guess, one of the hardest things I've have to ever had to face in my life. Um, I can't imagine going on from day to day without having him back. Two months later, the Maryland State Division of Vital Records received a call from a woman who claimed that she had given birth to a baby boy at her home two months earlier. The caller, 33-year-old Carlene Victoria Wilkinson, said that she wanted to get a birth certificate for her son, Tavon Anthony Wilkinson. Authorities immediately became suspicious and began an investigation. A DNA test later confirmed that the infant was actually Avery James Norris. Two-month-old Avery James Norris was immediately reunited with his real parents and went home for the first time. We're very happy. This is day one. We start our life right from today. But I'd just like to thank all the people who called and all the people who sent letters and cards and who prayed for us. And I thank you from, from my husband and myself and for our baby. Carlene Victoria Wilkinson was convicted of three counts of kidnapping and sentenced to 30 years in prison. She has since been released. You're about to meet a man named Guy Pence. He goes to work each day knowing that his job has made someone angry enough to try to kill him. But he's vowed never to quit. Carson City, Nevada. On the window ledge. U.S. Forest Service Ranger Guy Pence arrived at work one morning to find that his office had been ripped apart by a bomb the night before. You know, I don't know what kind of bomb... The FBI believed that the bomber had targeted just the building, but Guy thought there was more to it than that. I really always felt that it was aimed um, as a direct statement to me. Now, it may be aimed as a direct statement to me as a district ranger or as a federal employee, and not so much uh, at me specifically. Why would Guy Pence or the Forest Service be a target? Perhaps because they are on the front line of a war that most of us don't even know about. Some call it the Sagebrush Rebellion. Ranchers, loggers, and miners who are opposed to federal control of local public lands. For nearly a century, many of them have had permits that give them access to huge tracts of that land. But gradually, federal regulations to protect the land have restricted their use. Rangers like Guy have to enforce these new laws, which brings them face to face with angry protesters. If you wind up with 22 extra tomorrow, I mean, just bring it back up on your own and we'll just call it good. No, I don't think so. that's the case. We're running the whole herd through. Michael, we went through this. We said 800 and you said you weren't gonna give me any trouble about it. I don't think that's the case, Guy. You're making a mistake, Michael. Guy says scenes like this have become a regular part of his job. 
And in some cases, rebellious ranchers have the support of their local officials. You make it The issue that we have here is these people have a right to graze forage, they have a right to mine the minerals, they have a right to harvest term timber, and the bureaucrats have exceeded their authority in some way or trying to stop them one way or the other, and we are standing up as county governments to protect their rights. Up here tomorrow, we're gonna cut those Although out. local leaders support the land use, none of them support the use of violence, like the bombing of Guy's office. We were devastated by it. We want to put a stop to it as bad as anybody else. Four months after the bombing, any question about whether Guy Pence had been personally targeted was erased. Guy was out patrolling the back country. His wife was at home with their two oldest daughters. The homemade bomb had been placed directly beneath Guy's van. How many do we have? Fortunately, no one was hurt in the explosion. It's a very hard thought to accept that someone would try to kill your family. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that whoever did this knew my family was at home. The windows were open, the lights were on, the TV was on. My own daughter heard their footsteps and that they left a killing device and ran into the darkness. I have a hard time comprehending how any human could do that. Like the first bombing, there are few solid clues and no suspects. The FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. has advised us that these bombs are very similar in construction. We're looking for someone who knows the, the basics and the basic use and uh, application of explosives to make this bomb, but this was not a mastermind by any stretch of the imagination. Guy and his family have moved to another location. He could have quit his job, but Guy chose to keep working for the Forest Service. I think the stakes are very high. Those stakes are our natural resources. Those stakes belong to all of us, 300 million Americans. And those unborn today, those, are, those resources belong to them. It's extremely important to me that, that the forces that support this kind of thing understand that this is not ever how you win, that you only lose. That's extremely important, that this perpetrator be brought to justice so that everyone understands this is not how we solve our problems. If you have any information about the attacks on Guy Pence and his family, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, two people are healed, and they believe that prayer made the difference. Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Seeing something right. right so. Friday, December 1st. 42 year old Kathleen Burkhart is stunned when a sonogram confirms a large lump in her right breast. Kathleen's doctors fear the worst cancer. She is told to come back on Monday for a biopsy and possible mastectomy. I just went into an absolute panic. I had known two women that were younger than I that are dead from breast cancer. So I had this anxiety and this panic about not having breast surgery or even a biopsy. I didn't even want a biopsy. To alleviate her fears, Kathleen turned to meditation and prayer. I went home and I literally uh, told everybody to leave me alone, that I was going to concentrate my whole weekend on healing, and that I wasn't going to have that surgery on Monday. 
I put into practice everything that I had been reading about fasting and um, went on a fruit juice and fruit fast and listened to the tapes and did a lot of praying, got down on my knees and just really asked God to heal me. You have to take this away from me, please. I felt very peaceful, very calm, very serene. The fear went away, the anxiety went away. I became very convinced that I was healed and that this was totally gone. All right, let's see what we got. On Monday, Kathleen was x-rayed again just prior to her biopsy. I don't see any lumps. There are no lumps in their breasts today. Are, are you sure these are her pictures? Yes. Doctor, this is what I wanted to show you, the pictures that we took today and the pictures from Friday. What happened here? Kathleen's doctor was stunned but cautious. He wanted to conduct the biopsy anyway. Kathleen was adamant. She was going home. Seat on the basis of Friday's pictures. For many years, doctors have called these phenomena spontaneous remissions and explained it away, oh, that's just a spontaneous remission. But what is that? This is a healing. And we have to, as healers, find out how this happens, what are the mechanisms, so that more people can have this experience. Thankfully, Kathleen is still healthy. She continues to meditate and pray and go in for regular breast exams. But was she actually helped by the power of prayer? Well, some people are not so sure. There's no question that the mind exerts an influence over what happens in the body. The issue at hand is whether prayer or any other kind of mental exercise can predictably influence what happens to a person. And with respect to prayer, there simply is no evidence that it does. Dr. Larry Dossie, former chief of staff at Medical City Hospital in Dallas, Texas, disagrees. One of the best kept secrets in modern medicine is the scientific data surrounding prayer. Currently, there are over 130 studies showing that if you bring prayer into the laboratory, the hospital, or the clinic, the prayer works. The most significant study in the century, I think, uh, was done by Dr. Randolph Byrd at the University of California Medical School in San Francisco. It took place uh, in the coronary care unit. Almost 400 people were involved. Everybody gets treated with state-of-the-art coronary care techniques. The difference was that half the people get prayed for. The results showed that the prayed for patients did significantly better. They needed fewer drugs, there were fewer deaths in the prayed for group, and nobody in the prayed for group wound up on the mechanical ventilator. Twelve of the people not being prayed for had to have this done. Many in the medical community find Dr. Baird's study unconvincing, and even his supporters admit that when it comes to prayer, you cannot adequately monitor a human control group. Still, some patients and their families turn to prayer, as in this next case at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Though he was only 11 months old, Eric Donowski had just undergone a liver transplant. By the time he had his first transplant, he was already quite ill. His um, out look became progressively work be worse because the first liver uh, was rejected, uh, necessitating a second one, which was done about eight or nine days later. The second one, you know, I was like, how much more can his little body take? You know, he was so frail. So his, he had bones sticking out of his back. He was so skinny and had been bedridden for so long that we weren't, you know, you, you had your doubts, you know. I mean, I kept my faith, kept positive attitude, but in the back of your mind, there's always that doubt. Is he really going to be able to pull through all this, you know? Three weeks after Eric's second transplant, he developed viral pneumonia. Dr. Starzl gave him only a 50-50 chance to live. I didn't want to hear that my son wasn't going to live. There's nothing more the doctors could do, and the only thing that we had left was to hope that the Lord would answer our prayers. That same night, Debbie called a newspaper reporter who had written several articles about Eric's medical crisis. 
he promised to write another one. If you would, please. The article appeared a few days later. Churches all over central Pennsylvania began to fill with worshipers praying for little Eric Danowski. Within a few days, Eric experienced a sudden and unexpected turnaround. Less than a week later, his family and medical team gathered to celebrate his first birthday. I feel in my heart that Eric's recovery was definitely a miracle. It was the first day that I think I felt like a really sense of relief that he was going to make it. Did prayer give um, Eric a booster? Uh, I don't know. When I, when I was young, I would probably have scoffed at the idea. But I've seen things and uncovered things over the last uh, nearly 40 years that uh, uh, make me unwilling to be nihilistic about any possibility. And I think that includes uh, uh, prayer. Eventually, Eric underwent a third liver transplant. This one, a complete success. Eric was far too young to remember his ordeal, but his parents have told him about it. When I found out how sick I was, I realized that I was very sick and a lot of people were praying for me. I want to make one thing perfectly clear. If you've got appendicitis, you ought to have an appendectomy. We're not advising people to give up drugs and surgical procedures and just wing it with prayer. Uh, on the other hand, you should feel free while you're doing that, while you're having surgery for your appendicitis, to get prayed for too, because there are studies which show, literally, that prayer increases the healing rate of surgical wounds. So we ought to do what works. I think this just falls in the category of common sense. Did prayer help Kathleen Burkhart and Eric Donowski? Each of us must decide that for ourselves. And while prayer will never take the place of medicine, it may offer a very powerful assist.